very kind introduction. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be uh, with you this evening and uh, to discuss truly one of the greatest challenges that is facing Israel today in the world and what you heard previously are manifestations of that. So I will begin by saying something and you will uh, uh, excuse me if the language is harsh or militant, but this is war. Uh, Israel is right now at war. And it is a war in which the weapons are not tanks, they're not airplanes, they're not missiles. The war is waged with words, with images, with ideas. And these are the weapons of this war. Now, you might say, boo-hoo, big deal. At least the war that is being waged now against Israel is not with tanks and airplanes. At least it's not about invading armies. At least it's not about physical threats to our survival. But I would argue that these matter just as much, if not more. Because those who wage this war against Israel, they understand, maybe consciously, maybe subconsciously, they understand something very fundamental about what makes Israel strong. What makes Israel strong is not its superior military force. It's important. What makes Israel strong is not the thriving economy. And I would say what makes Israel strong is not even its people. What makes Israel strong is the idea that drives its people. Israel is a country that was first and foremost born here. It was born as a vision, as an idea in people's minds. And it was an inspirational idea. It was an influential idea. It was such a powerful idea that it drove young people to leave behind their parents. It drove people who were about to graduate from prestigious universities in Europe to become farmers in the Galilee. It was truly an idea that moved mountains. Now, if this idea that had and has so much power is somehow made to be so distasteful, so abhorrent, that none will want to touch it, then something deep in what makes Israel strong is weakened. And if you want to look at history, all of the physical atrocities, I would say all, maybe perhaps almost all, all of the physical atrocities in our world are preceded by laying the ideological groundwork. No one who ever commits an atrocity thinks they're committing an atrocity. Even the Nazis thought they were doing something good for mankind by ridding it of the Jews. So you first lay the ideological groundwork, and then the atrocity doesn't seem so bad. So if you create an ideological framework by which Zionism, the powerful idea that has created this reality, without this, none of this is here. If you create an ideological framework, a condition by which Zionism is equated with all that is evil in our world, even you here today who support Israel, if I say to you the word Zionism, you immediately know to tell me what are the words that are today associated with it in our world. It would be apartheid, genocide, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing. Now, we live in a world where we are always ready to believe the worst about everyone. You see it always on the news. The, the, the neighbor who suddenly... Um, kind of charged with being a pedophile, and suddenly all the neighbors would say, yeah, there was something weird about him. And later when he's exonerated, uh, that doesn't matter anymore. So we're ready to believe the worst. And people believe that there's no smoke without fire. So repeated enough time 
Show one enough placards. Zionism equals colonialism. Zionism equals apartheid. People will begin to believe it. And people will begin to think, if Zionism is so evil, so terrible, it almost becomes mandatory to get rid of its manifestation, the state of Israel. It no longer will be considered an atrocity. It will no longer be a tragedy if Israel doesn't exist because it was so evil. It was all that is evil in our world. And notice how much time you spent here discussing the way that Israel is not apartheid. But just by making that discussion, we're losing. Because we are being forced to put the words Israel and apartheid in the same sentence. Even by denying it. Even by saying it's not true. This is part of what, of how this war is distance. So the war is being waged with the idea that we will have to defend ourselves against the worst charges. And the sad thing is that there are still people who think that it is about facts, that it is about arguments, that it is about truth. Right? We are here under an event of truth be told. The thinking perhaps is, say the truth, the truth has power. I wish it were so. Go even more. Oh, uh, facts are not enough. Truth is not enough. If that were the case, we would not be in the situation of where we are today. Perhaps I will stop for a minute. If, no, you're going to take care of it? Okay. So I'll try to continue. So we need to understand that those who wage the war, they don't care about facts. They don't care use, about use, truth. Use the other mic. Use the other mic. The other mic. Is there another mic? The other mic might be If you turn it off, it probably will be fine. That could be the problem also. You're saying if you turn this off, maybe that's the problem? Yeah. Okay. So, think we're good? Is that the wire that is doing it? No, it was doing it even oh. without the wire. Yeah. I think it's this. It was this. Okay. Okay. I think we'll be good. So, we need to understand that those on the other side. They don't care about truth. They don't care about facts. You talked about a debate. They don't care about debating as a form of finding the truth, of making a better argument. It's not about that. It is about war. And the ultimate goal of this war is victory. We need to define it as our goal, and I will explain. But on the other side, there is still this belief on behalf of some of our people that it is about what we argue, what we say, getting better facts, getting better arguments. All of these matter, but they're not going to be effective if we don't understand that the other side has no problems using weapons. And the weapons in this war are lies, and more lies, and more lies. And they're being repeated, and there's manipulation, and that is part of the tools of war. It's not about finding the truth. It's not about figuring out what are the facts. And what is the goal of this war? What is the end? What is the purpose? Quite simply, the end of Zionism, the end of the State of Israel. Because this war is merely the next phase in a variety of wars that have been waged against Israel by a variety of means, by invading armies, by terrorism, by economic strangulation of states, I'm not talking about BDS yet. Israel has had to face all of these challenges. And why? Because at the core, the Zionist idea, 
the simple, inspirational idea that the Jewish people as a people, not as a religion, as a people, have the right to self-determination in the only land that they could ever call their own, that powerful idea is still denied, certainly in this region and increasingly far <coughs> beyond. It is denied in every aspect of it, that the Jewish people are not a people, that they have no real connection to the land, that they have taken a foreign land, mm -hmm. that they are colonialists. You know, it is interesting, there is, you know, I don't know many colonial movements that went about purchasing land, turning uh, academics into farmers, and went about this, uh, and really went to a place that had no natural resources whatsoever. So, going in this direction, this idea that the Jewish people are not a people, they have no connection to the land, and therefore they have no right to self-determination, and if they do, it's not here. This idea is being denied. And this is the idea that made the reality of Israel possible. Without it, there is no modern state of Israel. And this is the idea that's being attacked. And sadly, and we need to understand, certainly in this region, there's still no acceptance of the Jewish people as equals. There was an excellent piece in Haaretz, I think a couple of weeks ago, about a researcher who used to be very much on the radical left, and uh, he's moved, and he talked about the story of the Jews in Arab countries. There's a tendency to describe it as a harmonious uh, kind of living. It was harmonious in the sense that as long as the Jews in Arab countries knew their place, which was a subservient, protected people, uh, it could be harmonious. But as soon as the Jews had the gall to be equal, to demand sovereignty, to be a powerful state right smack in the middle of the Middle East, well, that's not acceptable. And that is, we need in many ways to appreciate the perspective of the other side. It is a shock of historic proportions that you don't get over easily. To take a people who were second class, who were subservient, who knew their place for centuries, and within several decades, Within the lifespan of one person, they are equal, they are powerful, and they're in your face. That's not something that you can accept, expect uh, people to get over quickly. So the idea is still not accepted. And when we hear today people saying, violence against Israel has been renounced. Well, we think that's a wonderful thing. And when we hear that the other side is using nonviolent means against Israel. Now, when you tell people they are waging a nonviolent uh, struggle, battle against Israel, well, what do you think of? You think of Martin Luther King. You think of Gandhi. You think of some elements of Mandela. But the idea is if the battle is being waged by nonviolent means, clearly the ends of this battle must be noble. But as Mandela himself even said, you can wage a violent battle for a noble goal, and you can wage a nonviolent battle for a very sinister goal. And that's what we have here. Renouncing violence is not because the other side has found Gandhi has decided to become a pacifist. It is because violence has failed them, quite simply. They have failed by violent means, but they have not given up on the goal. So they are using the means that they think right now might be most effective. Words, images, ideas. Turning the idea that makes Israel strong into something that no one will want to touch. So that one day, the physical reality will follow. That is the basic end of this war, nothing less. It's not about freedom for the Palestinians. 
It's not about liberty for the Palestinians. It is not about having a Palestinian state. And I will say, all are goals that I support. But it is about, it's not about having what the United Nations envisioned, a Jewish state and an Arab state. It is still about not having the Jewish state. That is still the battle that is being waged, simply by different means. Now, I will say that one of the problems, still, but less than in the past, is that there is a defeatist attitude when it comes to this war that this is a war that we cannot win, that at most we can hope to draw a tie, maybe score some points, but that we're too strong, we're too powerful, no one will ever believe us uh, you know, if we're trying to show that we're under threat, so we can't win this war. But I would argue that we said, we thought, certainly people thought about that, about terrorism, about suicide bombing. Do you remember that time? There was a sense that there is no way we could deal with that. And we did. And I would argue that we will win this war as well. It will take us about as long that it took us to win all our other wars. A generation. 20 to 30 years. It took us about 20 to 30 years to get the Arab armies to decide that it's not worth it to try to invade Israel. It took us several decades to demonstrate that the Arab boycott is not going to stifle the Israeli economy and that we can basically behave as if we're an island. If we're forced to be an island, we'll just uh, trade with everyone else in the world and to build a thriving export-based economy. And we've even been able to put terrorism in bed to the point that I do think we can declare victory. Not that there are not efforts, but it has been one. And it will take us time to win this war, and we will make a lot of mistakes on the way, as we have in our past wars. But we will win. And how do I define victory? Because some people will say, it's one thing to win a war against an army, but how do you define victory in this war of images and ideas? And I say quite simply, the definition of victory is the day that those who hold these opinions, who voice these opinions that we've heard against Israel, against Zionism, will have the social acceptability of neo-Nazis. And that is my definition of victory. It's about the social acceptability of these ideas. Because right now, these ideas, it's exactly the opposite. The more you hold on to these ideas, the more you gain social acceptability. In some circles, liberal, left-wing, academic, this is the only way to move forward. As a student recently told me, as she was looking at her PhD options, she can either write an anti-Zionist PhD abroad or a post-Zionist PhD in Israel. <laughs> and, uh, and those are kind of uh, the options that she was describing as looking at. So the idea is about social acceptability, about what gets you in, what gets you promoted. And right now, these are the ideas that get you in. These are the ideas of social acceptability. Traditional anti-Semitism has lost its social acceptability for obvious reasons. So this is the new way to still have social acceptability by voicing very extremist views, but somehow not perceived as such, perceived as liberal, as progressives. So I would say first is to understand that this is war. Second is to understand that victory is the goal, nothing less. No defeatist attitude. And then we need to do what we did with all our other strategic challenges, mobilize the people, the resources, the leadership. We are still not treating this challenge on par with physical challenges. I can tell you that as a member, a member of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, I started to talk about this issue about, I would say by now five years ago. 
So it spoke about about four or five years ago. And you can imagine what the Israeli Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee is. It's mostly the Defense Committee, high testosterone levels. And when I spoke of this war of images and words and ideas, I would get these like really cute pat on the head of, of the kind of, oh, that's so adorable. This idea of a war of words and images and ideas, it's so girly, truly sweet. And that was the sense in the beginning. Later we had the Marmara event. Uh, I'm on record uh, about a month before as the fleet was being prepared to say, <laughs> to say that, <laughs> so I was on the record about a month before to say, this is not about a military threat to Israel. Seriously, nobody thought that this ship was a military threat to Israel. It is about an image campaign. And the last thing we should be sending there are soldiers. Because that's what the other side is expecting and wanting. But this is a thinking that was military threat, you sent soldiers. You used the tools that we thought we needed to win, as we always say in the previous <coughs> war. But this was a new kind of war, and I can say that following this event, there has been a far greater understanding that this is a strategic threat to Israel and Zionism. The Prime Minister, two months ago in his speech at APAC, used about a third of his speech to talk about this challenge. That sent a message when the Prime Minister of Israel devotes a substantial share of his speech to talk about this issue, that's sending a message that that's where we expect mobilization. And what characterizes this war is that it's not defined by the borders of Israel. It's everywhere, in every arena, around the world. In many ways, Jews around the world felt it before <coughs> Israel, because they are and were on the front lines and campuses and university, both the faculty and the students in the United Nations, in the media, the new media, and the old media. This is a multi-arena challenge. <coughs> and as we mobilize, we need to understand several things. First, we cannot leave any arena unchallenged. You talked about the importance of being there. There is a tendency to say, what they're saying is so crazy, or this is so minor, or this is unimportant, <coughs> that we're not going there. But in this age,